right. Uh, welcome, everyone. As you all are filing in to the Zoom space, welcome to the last panel of Expanding Empathy 2023 here at the Rock Ethics Institute at Penn State. Um, I'm your host, Daryl Cameron, uh, an Associate Professor of Psychology and Senior Research Associate in the Rock Ethics Institute. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, it'll, it'll be a fun last panel uh, for this year, our fifth year of the series. We have two uh, distinguished guests who are joining us. Um, I'm also joined by my, my uh, co-host, uh, Martino Orlandi in philosophy from Trent University, uh, who will also be helping me co-moderate today's session. So let me briefly uh, introduce each of our speakers. Um, I'll start by introducing Dr. Anat Perry, who is an associate professor of psychology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, she studies a lot of a lot of fascinating, interesting topics in social cognitive affective neuroscience of empathy. Um, she's published in a lot of the top journals in our field, including uh, Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences, Nature Communications, Social Cognitive Affective Neuroscience. Um, she uh, received the President's Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of Haifa, the Hebrew University's Postdoctoral Scholarship for Outstanding Women Doctorate Students, and the Marie Curie Postdoctoral Global Fellowship and the Golda Meir Fellowship Award. Um, she's also received grants from the Israel Science Foundation, the Joy Ventures Foundation, and the US-Israel uh, Binational Science Foundation on a project on empathic accuracy. And so she's gonna start us off. I'm gonna introduce Dr. Kapanen as well, but her she, she'll be speaking first about different channels of uh, manifesting empathy in our social lives. Um, she'll be followed by Dr. Antti Kapanen, who's a professor of practical philosophy at the University of Helsinki, um, and PI of the Academy of Finland Research Project, Responsible Beliefs, Why Ethics and Epistemology Need Each Other. Dr. Kapanen's work focuses mostly on ethics and meta-ethics on topics like normativity, meaning in life, well-being, and moral sentiment, such as empathy and anger. Um, he also likes to teach political philosophy. And since November of last year, 2022, he's been an editor at uh, his favorite journal, as he says, uh, philosophy and phenomen phenomenological research. Um, and I, I can say I am also familiar with Dr. Kapanen's work, uh, empathy and morality and empathy regulation, especially, which I think will be a, a really interesting, nice way to, to close out some of the broader considerations of empathy in this year's series. So looking forward to wonderful talks from both of our speakers. And uh, whenever you are ready. Oh, one more thing. We have questions. Uh, we do have the Q&A function in Zoom at the bottom. As a live webinar, um, your video and audio won't be on, but do drop in any questions you have throughout the speaker's talks, and uh, Martina and I will do our best to notice these and, and bring them up to the speakers. So yeah, do use those. So if you, without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Perry. So thank you for this introduction and for inviting me to this amazing, serious talk. I really enjoy watching the, the previous um, recordings. And today I'm going to talk to you about the role of different information channels to the empathic process. But before I do, I want to introduce you to the work I do in my lab. So I study social cognitive neuroscience broadly defined. I ask social questions mostly related to empathy and social interactions. And I use cognitive neuroscience tools in the lab. So you see here some EEG work and physiological measures eye tracking, um, we look at clinical populations, lesion patients, as well as um, students and, and um, a healthy population. And we ask different questions related to empathic accuracy and synchrony, empathy for pain, empathy and intergroup relations, empathy and humility and sleep and empathy. And today we're going to focus specifically on this question of empathic accuracy and synchrony. This will be the outline of my talk. I'll start with um, a very short definition of how I see empathy and how we measure it in the lab. And then I'll, I'll um, show some studies from our recent years on contribution of different information channels to empathy using behavioral and physiological measures and some EEG data. And then I wanna focus on this question, why do we feel that seeing each other is so important in these emotional interactions and tell you a bit about current directions. So let's start. Empathy is broadly defined as the ability to understand and share others' thoughts and feelings. 
It encompasses an affective dimension, sharing the other person's emotional states, as well as a cognitive dimension, understanding another person's internal states. And importantly, both of these dimensions can lead to feeling empathic concern, compassion, and to pro-social behavior. Now, I'm aware of another aspect that I'm a bit ignoring here, this motivational aspect of empathy, which I actually think is really important, and we're starting to study now, so I can tell you a bit more about this at the end of my talk. But most of this talk will focus on these two affective and cognitive dimensions. I think they both lead to motivation to empathize, and also motivation to empathize, of course, leads to these two dimensions. So they're all really intertwined. But how do we measure these things in the lab? So for many years, people have used, and we still use some of these uh, kinds of stimuli in the lab today, these very simplified and controlled stimuli, because we need it, especially if you think of cognitive neuroscience research, we need to use repeated measures, so to show the same kind of stimuli again and again and again, and we want it to be very controlled, and we want to be able to show the same kind of stimuli to different people. And so we use things like this. These are classic empathy for pain stimuli. I can't see your faces now, but when I show these to a class of, you know, 100 people, you always have people really moving around in their, in their chair, feeling uncomfortable. And you can see that these really elicit some kind of feeling in yourself. What we can do in the lab is ask people to rate. You can try this here, for example, on this scale from run to nine. This is an arousal scale. What do you feel when you see these pictures? Some people have, have a more clearer feeling than others, but, you, but most people do feel something in their body when they see these kinds of pictures of people in pain. We can also ask how well you are, how accurate you are at understanding other people's emotions and typically use these very stereotypic um, facial expressions done usually by actors. So you can try to understand these people's emotions. What my lab and I have started to do six years ago, and we're not the only lab doing this, so this is something that's been happening the last decade at least around the world, is also looking at empathy with more naturalistic tasks. This has been done in psychology for a while, but we're also trying to bring this in to the social neuroscience world. So what we've done five or six years ago is we've started bringing in real people to the lab. Note, these are not actors. These are people from the community who come in and tell stories as they see them, their real autobiographical emotional stories to a camera as if they were telling us, telling these stories to someone else. I'll show you just a few seconds of this story. It's a story in Hebrew. So most of you probably won't understand it, but try to see if you can infer something about this emotional story from her facial expressions, her tone or anything else that you can um, think of. Uh, והיינו בהפסקה, בכיתה, וישבנו ליד אחד השולחנות בכיתה, ואני זוכרת שכמה בנים בכיתה הציפו לי. אני לא זוכרת בדיוק למה הם הציפו לי, או בדיוק מה בדיוק היה שם, ואני זוכרת שהם כאילו היו מסביבי, אני ישבתי שם על איזה כיסא, ואו שהם צעקו בקול ממש רם, או שהם כאילו דיברו אליי לא יפה. הייתה לי תחושה מאוד מאוד לא נעימה, וזיהיתי ילד אחד כילד הדומיננטי. So obviously you don't understand most of the story, but maybe you can infer something, right? The valence, is it a positive or negative story? Something about what was going on. Now we've recorded around 300 different stories so far in the lab from both Jewish, Israeli, and Arab, Muslim, and Christian um, students and people from the community telling their own emotional stories. Um, we're also starting to work with clinical populations now, people with autism telling their actual emotional stories. I can say a bit about that in the Q&A. And so these people come into the lab, tell their emotional stories. We ask the stories to be around two, three, four minutes long. We also record their physiological measures while they're telling the story. So we now have measures of their heart rate, for example, their heart rate or their galvanic skin response, how much they were sweating. These are two measures of their arousal state, right? How much they're excited um, when or, or aroused or scared or um, anything in that realm when they're telling the story. We also show them their own stories afterwards and ask them to rate on this negative to positive scale on a second by second basis, how they felt while they were telling the story. So they can rate whether they felt you know, very positive and then maybe a bit more negative and so forth. And we get this kind of 
um, second by second rating, you see here time on the x-axis and the rating on the y-axis of what they felt while they were telling the story. Um, we also wanted to, to get more information about specific emotions. So this gives us a general um, valence scale, but you don't know, for example, whether she was scared or angry or sad. So we also asked them after the story about specific emotions. In general, in this two, three minute story, how much happiness did you feel? How much sadness and, and so forth? So now we have around 300 stories of real people. We have this data set of real people telling their real emotional stories as they would tell them to someone else. We have their physiological measures and we have their own ratings of what they felt when they um, told their stories. And we can now bring in people to the lab and show them these stories. We can take physiological measures. We can, sorry, show this, them these stories using different information channels, which will be the focus of our talk today. So they can see the full video. They can just see the video with no audio at all and try to infer the other person's emotions from their facial expressions or body movements. Or we can just have them listen to the story without seeing the person at all. We can also record similar physiological measures from the observers and see how much they differ or are similar to that of the target. And we can have them write second by second what they think that the target is feeling. And this gives us a measure of empathic accuracy because we actually know what the target felt when they told the story. Um, and we can also use other measures, for example, record EEG, look at um, what happens in your brain when you watch these videos. We can also ask other questions to these um, observers. I can get a bit more into that later on. And then, like I said, we get these empathic accuracy measures. So what you see here are two examples. In both of them, you see in this light blue, the targets rating. And on the left, in orange, you see one of the observer's ratings. And you can see they were very accurate. So they got a high score. While here on the right, you see someone who is much less accurate. Um, you can also look at an example from one target on these specific emotions. And this was interesting and nice for me to see as an effective researcher, because it shows us that even in a two minute story, um, people usually don't just feel one emotion. It's not just sad or just pride. You can see there are actually a lot of different complex emotions, even in a two, three minute story. So let's look at some data and see what we did with this and what we found in the lab. So the first study we did is we showed people in the lab these video clips of people, just like I told you, in three different conditions, either video only, audio only, or both audio and video. We had people rate the target's affect. We already had the target's self-reported affect ratings from before, and we could calculate these accuracy variables. We also took physiological measures from both the target and the observers, and we said that a correlation between the behavioral ratings will be a proxy for empathic accuracy or these cognitive measures of empathy while a correlation between the heart rate measures will give us some proxy of this effective synchrony, right? How much your emotional state is in sync with that of the target. And here's what we got, and I'll walk you through this step-by-step. Step. So first, let's look at empathic accuracy. Here you see in green the video-only condition, and we see people are not that good at inferring the other people's emotions, but they're better than chance. And you probably got this intuition when you watched the movie, right? Maybe you could say something about, was it positive or negative and how strong were the emotions, but you didn't really know what was going on. Well, once you have the auditory information and if you speak the language, you're much better at understanding what the other person was feeling. Interestingly though, when you have both information, this is the full condition, audio plus video, you don't get any better. You're just as good as the audio condition. We see this in this continuous um, measure of empathic accuracy. You see the same kind of results in the specific emotion score. So when they rated specific emotions, but interestingly, we see something different happen with the heart rate synchrony. So when you try to understand the other person and actually it's hard to understand them and you don't have any words, you just have their facial expressions and movements like you see me here and you don't have the um, audio information at all, you're actually more in sync. Something in your body gets more in sync with that um, other person in, in trying to understand them. And we can see that these different measures are slightly correlated. So there's a correlation between the different cognitive measures. If you're good at this continuous measure, you're also good at understanding specific emotions. And importantly, there's also a correlation between the cognitive and effective measures. And it's a correlation, so we don't know which drives which, 
But maybe if you're more in sync with the other person, you understand them better, or it could also go the other way around, right? When you're better at understanding them, you're more in sync in uh, feeling their emotions. So we see both of these here. And then we thought we actually have another good proxy of this kind of simulation or synchronization with others. And that's a measure called EEG mu suppression. That's the next study that we did in the lab. And it's a collaboration, uh, the, person, the people who led this study are actually Desmond Ong, who is now, who was in um, Stanford, then in Singapore, and is now in Austin. And Sheila Genzer, my PhD student. And to give you a very short background, EEG um, mu suppression is measured over sensory motor cortex in EEG. So you can see these two electrodes here where we measure this um, measure. And it's, they're known to be suppressed when one performs goal-directed action. So you really see this suppression in this area when I um, grasp my cup, for example. But interestingly, it also shows suppression when you see someone else during these goal-directed actions. And this led many people to think they're related to what's known as the mirror neuron system or some kind of simulation system that helps us understand others. And in the last um, almost 20 years now, there's been growing research showing that you see this suppression in these new rhythms um, when you see other people's actions, when you see other people in pain, when you try to infer their intentions or their facial expressions. And these are lots of studies that I've done throughout my PhD and postdoc and others. But in all of these, we used again, these very simplified stimuli and we didn't have actually a measure of accuracy. So we see suppression in this area when you see others in pain versus no pain or doing some facial expressions towards you versus not towards you, but we don't know if it really assists or is correlated with being accurate in these tasks. And this is what we wanted to do here. So you're already familiar with the design, it's the exact same design. We ran it once, actually when I was here as a postdoc, so I wanna say six, seven years ago, on 20 Americans using with the American empathic accuracy test from Stanford. So these were American videos in English with American um, observers in, in Berkeley. Um, and then I left and went back to the Hebrew University and opened my lab and, and started developing this stimuli set in Hebrew in Israel. And then we replicated the results that we found here with a smaller group with a bigger group of Israeli um, students in Israel. So this allowed us not only to replicate results, but now to replicate them in a different setting, in a different culture, in a different language, with different stimuli and so forth. And again, behaviorally, we find the exact same results. So this is the American sample. You see people are better than chance when they have video, much better when they have audio with no difference between audio and audio and video together. And we see a correlation across these different conditions with mu suppression. It's a bit weird. It seems like it's a negative correlation, but this is because suppression is this negative measure. If you have more mu suppression, you're better at this task. We then replicate the behavioral results in a different sample in a different language. People are better than chance when they just have the video, no difference between audio and, and both conditions. And here we only partially replicate the results. We see that mu suppression is correlated with empathic accuracy when you just have this video information. So first we see people are very good here in this Israeli version and the two other ones. Um, so maybe we didn't have enough variants. Maybe they didn't need to rely on these sensory motor cues when you can only rely on them, they correlate with accuracy. So we see that sensory motor cortex contribute to accurate understanding especially when there's mo mostly visual information. But I wanna focus mostly on the behavioral results now. So I, told, I showed you in the first study that people are as good when they just hear the other person and when they have both information cues. And this surprised us a bit because we thought that, you know, seeing the other person definitely contributes something. And we were um, more intrigued once we replicated this in this EEG sample in Israel in this EEG sample in the US and in studies that I haven't showed you today, but this is an example for, for example from a lesion cohort, both from people who have brain lesions, but also from age match controls. So both older people and younger people in Israel, in the US, in different tasks, all show the same uh, result of really you don't need to see the other person to be accurate at understanding them. 
And this reminded me of a completely different task by my colleagues from the Hebrew University, Hillel Aviezer, uh, and his lab, where you might be familiar with this task. What they show here is in different experiments that when you ask people to infer these emotions from these pictures and where they got the information, people infer the emotions and say that they got the information from the face. The face is really important as we believe to understanding this emotion. But actually what you see here in the different pictures is the exact same emotion. And you infer different emotions from the pictures. Most people infer disgust here, anger here, fear here, and sadness here, depending on the context. So what Hillel Aviezer and others show quite well is even though our intuition is that we're looking at the face and we need the face, we actually rely much more on contextual information. In this case, the context is in the pictures. In our case, the context is in the words. And this left us with this last question I wanna talk about today is why do we feel that seeing the other person is so important? And we struggled with this question and had two different ideas. One is that maybe, you know, what we showed you until now is not these live interactions. These are inter live interactions on camera. You can have live interactions face to face. But what I showed you until now were these videos of people. So maybe if you have a real interaction when you see the other person, these cues actually become important. And the second suggestion, which is actually what we hypothesized, is that perhaps seeing the other person in these at least um, emotional interactions is less important for empathic accuracy, but it actually contributes to other more effective components of the interaction. And this is what she again, so my PhD student um, went out to investigate. And this first study that she ran during COVID um, on Zoom, she had 240 participants in 120 same-sex pairs go online together with an experimenter. And the experimenter told one of the speakers they are going to tell an emotional story to the other person. And the other person, the listener or perceiver, had to listen to their story. The experimenter then went offline. So they had the, the um, discussion or the talk by themselves. And when they were done, the experimenter came back again and told them now to each rate the emotions of the speaker on 25 different emotions. This gave us again, this measure of empathic accuracy. The storyteller rate, rated what she herself felt when she told the story, and the listener had to rate what she thought the storyteller felt when she told the story. And then importantly, they both answered questions about their effective experience. So the sense that the perceiver was empathic, the storyteller had to rate how, how much empathy she felt from the listener, and the listener actually rated how much empathy she actually felt. And the sense that they listened uh, and the sense that both of them felt together during this conversation. And importantly, half of these pairs did this conversation with a camera off and half of them stayed with a camera on without seeing themselves on Zoom. So they only saw the other person. This is as close as we could get during COVID to this face-to-face um, -face interaction. So let's see the results. In terms of empathic accuracy, how accurate you are at understanding the other person, Oops, sorry, no difference between the two conditions. It may even seem that you're better when you have just the audio, but there's no significant difference between these two. So again, even if you can see the other person and maybe change how you speak or what you say according to their facial expressions or reactions, it doesn't help you in becoming more accurate. But when you look at the effective experience, you find a whole different story. So this is the sense of empathy. Well, the perceiver felt that they were very empathic in both conditions, right? You may even have the ceiling effect here. The storyteller actually felt this empathy when they were able to see the listener watching them. We see the same thing for the sense of listening. The perceiver said that they listened in both conditions, but actually the storyteller felt this listening when they could see the other person listening to them, and they both felt more together when they could see the other people throughout the interaction. She then did, replicated these results again in another cohort of 240 um, participants in another Zoom interaction. Some of the instructions were a bit different, but these results were exactly the same. You can see that people are feel more empathy, the storytellers feel more empathy when they could see the other person, feel that they're listened to, and both feel more together when they see the other person. 
So to summarize these results, in real life, first of all, social interactions involve different senses, right? I started here in this talk with a focus on face-to-face -face communication and in visual and auditory cues. Obviously, when you see your son running and falling, you don't need to hear what he says. You, you have this automatic um, empathic reaction, like the one that I showed you in the paint pictures before. So sometimes you don't need words. Um, I think that touch and smell and other senses have their role in empathy as well. But we wanted to start with these face-to-face -face communications, which we all do every day, and focus on visual and auditory cues. Real life is, of course, much more complex. We found that hearing the other person is more important for understanding them. Interestingly, though, seeing does not contribute to accuracy beyond hearing. However, seeing the other person contributes to the affective experience, to being in physiological sync, like we saw both from the physiological results and the EEG, feeling together, feeling listened to, and empathized with. And I really like this line of studies because I think it has both implications for basic, basic effective, and clinical science, but also lots of implications in current times when you talk to your family, friends, work remotely from home um, in this age of you know, telemedicine, um, clinical work online and so forth. I think we really need to take these kinds of studies into account. Now to the last slide I have on current directions, I wanna show you a bit about where we're taking um, these kinds of uh, results. So first, like I said, you can look at role of other senses. Now we can go back to the lab. We wanna see what happens when you can actually sit together with the other person and not just see them on Zoom. We wanna look at visual cues in nonverbal situations. Even in these verbal situations, we can look at feedback, what happens when you reply versus not reply, what kind of replies do we get from the listener, eye contact feedback and how important that is. We're looking at empathy over time, how much you remember from the interaction, what happens when this interaction unfolds. Um, and like I said in the start, we're now starting to um, use these kinds of tasks in clinical populations, both having them rate what these people in these videos feel uh, and so forth, but also filming people, for example, from autistic communities to tell their own emotional stories and tell what they feel when they told the stories and show what's called the double empathy problem, that maybe it's not only people with autism or other deficits who have a hard time understanding us, it's also us who have a hard time understanding anyone who's different from us. Um, and we hope through these that we could really see what contributes and what hinders these kinds of um, empathy problems. We're looking at in-group, out-group empathy. We have these um, videos in both Hebrew and Arabic from, from different populations in Israel and so forth. And with this, I wanna thank my lab members, um, the different funding agencies, and thank you guys for listening. Great, thank you. That was a, such a fascinating talk. And I'm already seeing some questions rolling in to the chat. So my colleague here, Sean Laurent, says uh, fantastic talk and thanks you for sharing this work. Um, he's wondering, he said he may have missed this, but is wondering why you think the physiological synchrony is so much greater in the visual channel or, or why there is a decrease in the audio channel. That's an excellent question. And it's something that we're still thinking about. What my intuition is, is that these synchrony measures are really important when you have when you have less cues, right? If you think about cognitive and affective empathy together, when we try to understand a young baby, for example, that doesn't have any words, we really need to focus on their facial expressions, on their body. And this is really related to this basic mirroring or simulation. That's what we do and that's what we that's the only cues we have. So what we can do is really use our body to simulate what the other person may be going through and experiencing. Once we have these, this auditory information, maybe we can um, use, and, and our task is to understand the other person, maybe we can use these more higher level cognitive skills to just listen to the words and understand what the other person is feeling. And we don't need these um, synchronized behavior in order to understand them better. But I think it's an excellent question that I don't have a clear answer about yet. Great. And just as a reminder, um, if you have a question for, for Dr. Perry, um, just drop it in the Q&A function in the bottom, and I'll try to 
to read it aloud. Um, yeah, I mean, I really, I really appreciate it. I, I think at the at the close of our of this year's series, like having kind of a nice discussion of like what empathy is and the different channels through which it manifests is really useful. And I can certainly see a lot of the practical relevance of this to how we interact on Zoom, i.e. right now. Um, and so it is kind of fascinating to think about those implications. I think what for me, as we await more questions, one one thing I was personally intrigued by, so not, not having the incremental benefit from video, which you people think you would, you often you think you would, but then from the perceive from the from the receiver of empathy from their perspective, it does appear to have these positives, and so I'm. This made me just think of the different motivational trade offs that may be in play when you think about from from a dietic perspective, both the empathizer and the empathize e uh, the person empathized with, like how those interplay with each other. And I'm thinking about this in the context of these various discussions we hear about whether people have their cameras on or off during Zoom meetings at conferences um, and different incentives people have, different motivations to, to use this space, this very space in different ways, depending upon their comfort, their social affiliation motives, um, especially if, if there were a cost to seeing faces, like, balancing that against the felt empathic benefit of being seen from the target side. I would just be curious in any, any thoughts you have about that. Yes. I think about it often. I think we all, since we have these zoom meetings right now, all, all the time. Um, and we, some of us still teach some of our courses over zoom or definitely had the experience of teaching for two years over zoom. We could really understand this delicate balance, right? Between when we're talking, it's so important to have to see the faces of other people listening to us um, and compared to when you're on the other side and it takes effort and you can just close your camera and maybe do other things or be less focused or maybe you don't want to have people look at you all the time or or any other motivation. And I think this brings us much closer to to questions of motivation, right? And there's always a cost. There's a cost at sitting and listening and putting effort and showing that you're there to the other person, right? Um, when we talk to a friend on the phone and we don't see them, I think there are ways we can compensate. And that's actually a third study that we're running now and I'm not showing you in which you keep saying, mm, wow, I don't believe it, right? And if you don't hear the other person on the other side, you think something's wrong. Maybe they're doing something else. Maybe there's no connection. Maybe they're not there. So we need to make an effort to show that we're there. If it's on the phone, we have ways to do that. If it's on Zoom and people can see us, then we nod, then we look at the camera. We know the other person is there. And once we don't do that, it's easier for us. So it takes less effort and the other person definitely pays a price. And I think this is something really important that people should know in the workplace, in classes, in all these different, in education, in all these different online interactions that are going on these days, that if all the sides are aware of these pros and cons, then really we, we can, you know, make um, decisions on how we are willing to, to have these interactions or not. And I think what more and more people are understanding, both in the workplace and in education and universities, is that probably we need to bring people as much as we can back to real life interactions. And we haven't, for two reasons. One is then you can't close your camera. You're just, you have to be there. Um, you can tell people, I, I sometimes do that in my seminars, close your computers, you know, put your phones away. So we need people looking at one another and listening and being together and communicating. You can do this better when you're in the same room. And second, I think there are probably other advantages that we still don't understand yet, but we all have a feeling of after two years of COVID and we want to measure in the lab now probably other senses play a role too. Probably sitting next to each other, you know, being in the same environment, thinking of other senses such as smell and touch, or even, you know, the option for touching the other person, even if you don't usually do that during the day, have being able to comfort the other person if they're there. All of these play a really important role that they're all, we're all missing once we decide to defer to this comfort of sitting at home and being on Zoom. Yeah, it, it does seem like, um, especially, I mean, Zoom does afford these advantages, certainly, like the fact that we are all sitting here from around the world in different places is kind of, it's a really neat 
gate into that possibility. But I agree with you; it does it does have these interesting trade offs. I did see your ha your hand too, Auntie. If you had a follow up or a different question, I I, I had a hand. Yes, so it, it was just uh, related to the Zoom experience. So so in the experiment, uh, you had the the visual side was mediated through through Zoom. So so do you think that could have made a difference to to the experience on on either side or, or on or possibly on both sides? Are you planning on trying to replicate that in you know actual face to face interaction? Yes, yes. So we definitely did that because of the constraints of COVID. That's when we ran these experiments. And what we want to do now as a next stage is see, compare. So we have three lines of experiments now who all show this these same line of results, right? So Zoom versus you know phone call, you see the advantages of seeing the other person. And we also show now that we can overcome at least some of these when we talk on the phone and, and, and put in a lot of effort to show that, the, that we are there. But our next stage is definitely to compare these Zoom interactions to real life interactions and to see what kind of advantages you get when you can actually sit and talk to the other person. Yeah, I mean, you talked about um, being in the same room, being able to look over and maybe like interact with other people physically. I was thinking about, you know, when we started teaching again in person, even if you're on Zoom and everybody has their camera on, I cannot read the vibe of the classroom the way I read it when I'm in class. Definitely. And it's been really hard to justify to myself the difference because what is the difference? Really, I'm seeing all the faces. If anything, it's better because it's a little bit like the panopticon when you're on Zoom. You see all people's faces. You can't really like pluck your nose or anything because everybody will see you uh, in a way in which you don't necessarily see when you're in class in person. And yet that seems like superior. There's that kind of like ineffable element, as you say, that somehow makes a difference. Right. So. It's like we want to say there's some energy, but what's that energy that you can exactly feel? like is it magic? Is it <laughs> yeah? So I think for so some of it, so I want to say there is something about these senses, right? Of and and of presence, right? There is a different presence if we're all in the same setting versus each one is in their own home. So that's one thing that's probably different. And then, like I said, maybe smell, maybe touch or physical aspects as well. But even the senses that we do use, even hearing, you don't really hear the same things that you hear in a classroom. Because when you're on Zoom, even if you see the students and usually you don't see all of them, then their volume is off, right? You don't see the whispering. You don't see the enthusiasm. You don't hear the enthusiasm, the whispering. They do understand. They don't understand. They're excited about something. Something is different when you when you're actually there, present, and and see and hear everyone in the same place. There's another question. Oh yeah, um, right. So, on this same theme, um, so Sean has a follow up question. Sean Laurent, he's wondering if accuracy for perceivers who are listening or only talking sometimes increases, as it might be easier to know if the other is bored, interesting, caring, et cetera, perhaps a dyadic synchronous method. I'm not sure I follow. So is the question is what happens over time if you can? So yeah, I think if, if accuracy for perceivers increases, perhaps it's over time within an interaction. Um, I, th I think, I think more generally, my read on the question, and Sean, please feel free to follow up if you'd like, um, is just to, okay, so meaning that both are rating something for self and other. So I, I think, I mean, the way I'm reading the question is that if, does it, from the perceiver's perspective, who's listening or watching, how does that change over time within the course of an interaction? Yes, I think I understand the question too. And also if they could rate each other, if they could keep rating each other. So there are studies who have done that even from the 90s, usually in, in these um, couples interaction. So um, uh, there are different labs in the US. Bob Levinson has run a lot of these studies and ECUS and others where they bring couples to the lab and they discuss different um, things from their daily lives. And then they each rate what the other person was feeling during the interaction. So you can look at that and you can look at the interaction unfolds. 
And that's definitely something that we're going to look at now in strangers and maybe also comparing stranger to friends and seeing how that changes when you have different information channels present. So when you're actually in the same room or when you're on Zoom, when you just hear the other person and so forth. And what, we're, what we've already been starting to do, and I didn't show you here, but we actually have results from these studies as well, is in some of these studies, we don't ask the perceiver to rate what the storyteller was feeling, but to rate their own feelings. And then this gives us a measure of synchrony, right? How much you're in sync with the other person. And here we feel, we see again, that the visual information is important. So when they could actually feel, sorry, when they could actually see and hear the other person, their emotions are more in sync. So the emotions that the perceiver rates is actually are actually more similar to the emotions that the storyteller felt. And I think that so good. And I think that Sean just had one more clarification, just saying that does the storyteller, the target, get more accuracy through the visual channel about what the listener is thinking slash feeling, given that they're also speaking? So we see that in some of our studies, yes. We, what we could measure is we have how much each of them rated that the perceiver, the listener, was listening or was feeling empathic. And we could actually see a correlation, again, when we have both um, channels, when you also see the other person, you're better at predicting what they would say, how much they felt that they listened, how much they felt that they empathized and so forth. We see that in some of our studies and not in others, but I think there's definitely something there as well. I agree. And it is interesting to think about just from the like the, the speaker's perspective, you know, when I've taught Zoom classes and sometimes students have their cameras on, sometimes off, it's always hard to know exactly the, the, the cost of trying to decipher like what those different social possibilities mean. You know, does, does it mean that I, there are students who just don't want to be seen or students who are engaged or disengaged, um, trying to like game out the kind of different social affordances of those situations does seem to become so much more complex when the cues are so ambiguous like that. I completely agree. And I think there are probably lots of different motivations for why students or, or all of us, right, sometimes close our camera during these Zoom talks. Each one has their different reasons, but on, you know, in all of them, there's a measure of effort, right? It's, it's harder to be present on Zoom all the time. And we all know from our experiences throughout these few years, that if we turn it off, we can be there, but we can also be other places, even, even if it's other places in our mind, right? It's easier when you're not, when, when you don't see yourself present there. So I think there are lots of different motivations. It might be an interesting question to study them, but in all of them, there's a real effort that we have to put in when we are there. And it's important that we all know, you know, the, the dark sides of not doing that. That would be a fascinating study question as a dependent variable. Um, well, there's one more question here, um, and then we should probably flip over to Dr. Kapanen's talk. So uh, one, of, one of the RAs in my lab, Lauren O'Rourke, uh, asked, apologies if, you have, if you've kind of touched on this, but she's curious how you think these findings may be implicated in people's parasocial relationships with individuals online, like celebrities, but also with, with friends online, too. Yes. So... I haven't thought of the celebrity part, so I don't have a clear answer on that. I have to think about it, but I do have some thoughts about friends. I think that in this era, like you said yourself, there, there are so many advantages of these Zoom discuss real advantages, right? Like having this class online here, these seminars. There are also advantages. I'm on sabbatical in California now. Lots of my friends and family are in Israel on the other side of the world. There are definitely advantages of being able to um, maintain our close relationships in these uh, during using these online tools. I also think there are some prices, though, in that for many people, there's a price in going out and socializing, making new friends, going out when there's bad weather, going out when, I don't know, you have young children and you're tired. And for all of these different reasons, people stay at home. And we have this social desire to meet people and talk to people if we can do that on Zoom or on the phone, we're sometimes more reluctant to go out and actually socialize in the world. This is something that, you know, it's it's in our works. It's something we want to study more. 
but I've been starting to read about it and think about it. And I think that's one of the big, again, pros and cons that we have with these options. Even with friends, it can make our friends closer. It can reduce how much we actually go outside and meet real people. And there's a price to that too. Um, we'll definitely circle back to more of talking about some of these points at once in the, the larger Q&A at the end, but I want to flip it over now to um, Dr. Antti Kapanen, who's going to talk about empathy, bias, and manipulation. Well, not not exactly as it turns out. I, I, I won't get to manipulation today, uh, but I will talk about empathy and, and bias. And... Uh, uh, and reason, as it as it turns out. Uh, okay, and uh, since uh, I'm going to be referring to some uh, well-known psychological studies and well-known philosophical theories, I I worry that everything I say is going to be obvious either to psychologists or to philosophers in the in the audience. My my only hope is that it's not all obvious to everyone in the audience. So, so let's let's see what we can do, and I'm going to cheat a little bit because I worry about going on too long. So, so I'm going to read for, for part of, part of this talk. All right. So, uh, let's let's start with empathy and and some problems that that people have identified with it when it comes to morality. So it's compulsory to begin every paper on empathy by giving your own definition of what you're talking about. Um, I'm going to focus on affective empathy here exclusively. And, and I'm going to mean by that roughly feeling an emotion for another that is congruent with and caused by either the other's actual emotion or a, a projected emotion. So given the second half of this definition, uh, you can empathically feel fear for someone who's happily ignorant of danger, perhaps as a result of imaginatively taking their perspective while correcting for ignorance and, and consequently projecting fear in their, their position. Now, there's, there's many further distinctions about empathy that that's, I'm not going to be uh, talking about today, not, not even going to talk about everything I have on the, on the slides. Now, from the perspective of a moral philosopher like, like myself, uh, empathy is of, of interest for two main reasons. Uh, first, it may motivate people to act in a morally good way. Stereotypically, feeling your pain may give rise to empathic concern or desire to ease the pain, which is typically a good thing. But it can also be a bad thing, as, as, as we'll see. And second, and, and maybe more importantly, uh, sharing the feelings of others can also make a difference to our moral judgments or our beliefs about what's right or wrong or, or good or bad. There's many possible explanations for this, but my favorite one starts from the assumption that our emotions in general involve appearances of, of reasons. So, for example, if I feel empathically angry because of the way that someone treated you, it's part of this experience that it seems to me that there's a decisive reason against the offender acting in the way that they did. And because of that reason, what they, what they did is, is morally wrong. One reason I like this story is that it, it highlights how our emotions and reason work together in our moral thought, rather than being like separate and opposed processes, as, as people sometimes suggest. And this is something I'm going to highlight throughout this, this talk. Now, Philosophers have long recognized that empathy, or, or what used to be called sympathy, has an effect on, on our moral thought. Perhaps most famously, David Hume argued already in the 18th century that when we consider certain character traits, such as generosity or justice, as virtues, that's because we take sympathetic pleasure in their good effects either in each individual case or as a part of a general practice. And then this pleasure in turn results in moral approbation. Yet Hume himself was very well aware of various biases and limitations of human empathy. 
I guess the quotations there on, on the slide show. He appreciated that we empathize more with those who are similar to us than, those, uh, than with those who are different. He also recognized the importance of various kinds of proximity, including spatial and temporal, but also proximity in terms of group membership. He observed that pre-existing negative sentiments or rivalry can be a block to empathy and even lead to antipathy. And finally, uh, he noted that we emphasize much more readily with benefits and, and harms to particular individuals uh, than unspecific or what we might call statistical benefits and, and harms. And he recognized that this means that empathy can sometimes conflict with the demands of justice. After all, justice may sometimes require that we take from the poor, we take from the responsible, and we give it to rich who don't need it and who, who will waste the, the things that we've taken. Now, I take that what I've just said is uh, overwhel overwhelmingly uh, corroborated by contemporary research on, on empathy. Uh, it's just a quick overview of, of some of the things that that uh, mesh with what, what Hume already thought about this. So uh, we do seem to empathize more with those who are similar to us, like for example, in, in Krebs' studies, uh, we react more strongly to electric shocks given to people we are led to believe are, are similar to us. We empathize uh, less with harm uh, to members of outgroups, especially rival outgroups, uh, for example, in a, in a well-known study, uh, Avenanti and co-authors found that people had reduced sensory motor responses to observing the pain of outgroup members. And Lomoriello and, and co-authors found similar results when the uh, same pain was observed at different physical distances, or like they had faces that were either bigger or smaller, indicating that physical distance in that, that study. Uh, Researchers have noted that, that we may take pleasure in the pain of rivals or, or outgroup members, as, as Chikara and, and co-authors found using the minimal group paradigm, of which a few, few words uh, later. And just as Hume suggested, that famously empathy for concrete individuals can lead people to judgments and actions that manifestly conflict with justice, such as favoring less needy or fewer individuals or more needy or, or numerous people. Now, one strand of contemporary research that does seem to go beyond uh, Hume's pioneering work is, is work on, on motivated empathy. This is something that Daryl, uh, among others, has contributed to and, and highlighted, that, that while we can empathize spontaneously, as it were, we can also be motivated to up or down regulate our, our empathic responses. After all, empathy is hard work as, as the title of one of Daryl's papers goes, and which leads people, the subjects to prefer that tasks that don't involve empathizing over those that do. And also acting on em empathy uh, can be costly, can have uh, external costs like by leading us to donate more money to, to victims, for example. Uh, of course, as, as uh, Jamil Zaki, who already got mentioned uh, today, uh, has, has pointed out among others, empathy, even with unpleasant emotions of other people, can have both internal and external benefits uh, in, in terms of strengthening our social ties. I guess this ties with some of the things that Anna was just saying. So they can also be motivation to upregulate e even unpleasant uh, empathic uh, emotions. Now, importantly, uh, for, for my purposes today, much of this work has shown uh, that, that there is also a kind of a second order bias to, to empathy that results from biased regulation. And it's particularly costly uh, to us in many ways to empathize with outgroup members, uh, which may motivate distraction and even dehumanization as, as strategies to keep our empathy uh, in check. Now in the, in the background, uh, another thing that uh, obviously, the original sentimentalist philosophers uh, in, in the pre-Darwin era didn't appreciate uh, is, is that empathy and it, its its biases and limitations can be accounted for, at least to some extent, by uh, 
by its uh, evolutionary background. Uh, so as, as, as Saki nicely summarizes it, our empathic dispositions have likely evolved for recognizing and responding to the needs of our offspring, uh, for, for tracking in-group attitudes and motivating cooperation with members, and for maintaining a boundary with outgroups. Now, this may also in part explain one of the key limitations of empathy, which is that we can only take on the feelings of one individual at a time, maybe a handful of individuals while we're deliberating about some, some issue. That's why empathy is innumerate, as, as Paul Bloom puts it. We don't empathize more with harms to 100 people than to three people, not necessarily. In fact, studies on the identifiable victim effect suggest the opposite. Okay, so given these biases and limitations, it's easy to see why many psychologists and philosophers have recently warned against relying on empathy in moral thinking. That most notably, at least in, in, in psychology, Paul Bloom argues that empathic engagement is, is apt to lead to, quote, bad decisions and bad outcomes, so that we should guide our compassion by reason and cost-benefit analysis, as, as he says. Even more polemically, he, he says that we should aspire to a world in which a politician appealing to someone's empathy would be seen in the same way as someone appealing to people's racist bias. And similar arguments have been made by Jesse Prince and uh, Jean Desity and, and others. I'll come back to that quote from Desity at the, at, at the end of my, my own presentation. Now, I'm obviously not going to challenge the, the empirical findings that, that the critics of empathy are, are relying on. That's not within my competence, and I have every reason to believe that those, those findings are, are correct. But I think that empathy nevertheless has a somewhat more important role to play than, than, the, than the skeptics allow. Now, the, the first thing I, I want to say and, and, and emphasize is, is that there really is a difference between empathy's biases and its limitations. So uh, in, in his recent book, uh, Bias, a Philosophical Study, Thomas Kelly offers a convincing defense of what he calls the norm-theoretic account of bias. And according to it, very simply, bias involves a systematic departure from a norm or standard of correctness, obviously one that is relevant in the, in the context. Uh, and that may depend on what, what the context is. Sometimes the relevant standard is truth, sometimes it might be uh, moral, moral rightness. So any charge of bias presupposes a norm for a correct response. And as we'll see, it's not obvious that in, in, in many situations, uh, the personal focus that is characteristic of empathy uh, results in some sort of problematic or systematic departure from, from correct responses. In fact, it might be just what is called for. Okay, so let's let's look at uh, some of those uh, aspects of morality where this sort of personal focus seems to be essential. Okay, so there is a kind of conception of morality which I think is is quite simplistic uh, that is entirely impersonal that says that the right thing to do is whatever maximizes uh, the amount of some intrinsic value in the world, such as such as well-being. But one thing that many philosophers have observed is that there is such a thing as morally justified partiality. And then it's not only morally permissible, but uh, sometimes even uh, morally required that we favor our children, our family, our, our friends, maybe even our, our countries. Like if we favor our own children only to the extent that it maximizes impersonal value, we're not responding correctly to their individual value and to the value of the parent-child relationship. One, one way to put this is to, to say that even though all children are, of course, of equal moral value, parents must care about their own children in particular. And caring is not just a matter of wanting your children to do well or doing, uh, sorry, or, or doing things for them. Uh, it, it, it does, it, it seems to me, require uh, also empathizing with the, with the person that you care about. So if you, if you care about your child, your emotional reactions will be at least sometimes and to some extent attuned with theirs. 
you'll be disposed to have at least broad affective empathy, as, as I call it, having, having responses that are uh, similarly valence to the, those of the child. So you'll be delighted with their joy. And while you might not join in the fear of the dark, it won't leave you emotionally cold either. You feel bad that they're, they're afraid, even, you, even if you think that there's no reason to be afraid. Okay, so so that's, that's the first and, and perhaps most obvious way in which uh, as the person focus of empathy is, seems to be morally called for. Uh, and that, that's something maybe empathy is skeptics might be might be willing to to grant in the context of personal relationships but deny when it comes to morality on a larger scale and here i think it, it really matters how we think about morality if you think it's basically about helping people and, and it does seem to me that in a lot of psychological research that i've read that it's kind of the assumption that morality is about helping people maybe helping as many people as as possible then empathy does look like a like a a problematic, particularly problematic emotion, because it's it is innumerate. Uh, but if you think that morality is basically, or at least in in part, basically about not hurting other people, uh, whether for egoistic reasons or for altruistic reasons, then then it's a different story. Uh, so so I'm going to talk about two contexts in which the personal focus of empathy might well be a good thing from a moral perspective. So so first, maybe most obviously. Uh, sometimes in order to help many others, we would have to hurt some people, at least, and maybe even use some people as a means, or hurt some people as a means of helping other people. For better or for worse, uh, in, in the psychological research, it seems like the, the footbridge trolley case has become the standard way of, of testing this. So, so in that case, as, as you all know, uh, you need to push down the one person in order to stop the trolley that prevented from killing killing five people. Like most people, I think it's wrong to push down the, the one person to save the five people in, in that situation. Now, while empathy might not be necessary for us to appreciate the reason against harming one in order to save many others, it certainly seems to help. As many of you will, will also know, uh, there's quite a bit of empirical evidence that people's willingness uh, to uh, to hurt one to help many is correlated with empathy deficits from various sources. So Veach and co-authors, co for example, conclude that such judgments seem to be driven by, quote, a lack of empathic concern and diminished aversion to harming others rather than a desire to, to help many other people. So that's one pretty familiar context in which, again, uh, Empathy kind of gives the, the morally right signal, right? the empathy uh, that focuses on, on the few rather than, than the many and, and kind of sets aside the, the, the numbers. Another case that's, that's very uh, familiar to uh, philosophers, but, but I haven't come across yet in, in psychological research, uh, concerns what, what I'll call irrelevant benefits. So, so this is a, a case in which there are certain trade-offs that seem to be morally illegitimate, even when they would, would maximize total benefit. Okay, so, so to put it, uh, put it simple, the, the issue here is that some of the benefits that we might gain are morally irrelevant in comparison to their costs. So, so one, uh, the, maybe the best known example in the philosophical literature comes from Thomas Scanlon's book, What We Owe to Each Other. So, so there's been an accident during the World Cup final, the, the football or soccer World, World Cup final, that has, say, a billion viewers. And as a result of this accident, there's one worker who's receiving elect, electric shocks uh, that, that are extremely agonizing in, inside the, the TV tower. The only way to rescue this person is to cut off the broadcast. And of course, that will have the result that all these billion people will miss out on, let's say, 15 minutes of, of the kind of pleasure that they get from viewing this very exciting sporting event. Now, if you add up those benefits to a billion people, then even if it's very, very agonizing for the one person, uh, the total sum of those benefits will exceed the amount of, of, of the costs. So, so if you're engaged in a cost-benefit cost benefit analysis, 
then then you will let the broadcast go on, let that one person suffer. But Scanlon's verdict is that, and and that of many other people is that this this is wrong. This is not how we how we should uh, compare costs and benefits. In in this instance, when the alternative is so costly to one person, these all these benefits to many 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 other people are, are not morally relevant. We shouldn't be making this kind of trade offs. Uh, my my guess based on, on previous research would be that people who are high in empathy or in high empathy conditions would be reluctant to make the, this kind of uh, trade-offs more, more so than, than uh, people with empathy deficits, for example. So, so, so the, which again suggests that empathy would uh, get us to appreciate the real reasons in, in this, this type of case. Now, the lesson from these sort of cases is not that numbers never count in morality. That would be silly, be ridiculous. But what they do suggest is that those numbers are not the only thing that counts. They could be that that empathy's most fundamental limitation, its personal focus, is, is also its, its greatest strength. So what it does, I think, at its best at least, that it's, it makes salient to us practical reasons that derive from particular individuals' value and interests. And these reasons can have great moral importance that serves as a corrective to what we might call um, impersonal bias, which is a way of applying the cost-benefit analysis to all of morality. This incidentally and speculatively seems to be something that is uh, distinctive of, of certain class of people in, in weird societies, this, this idea that morality can be reduced to kind of cost-benefit analysis. Now, of course, uh, None of this is to say that it isn't problematic to go with with empathy when when it's uh, a matter of favoring one person over eight people who are all in a similar situation where the costs on both sides are are similar. But even here, the issue isn't that the empathy for the one is insensitive to real reasons because because it is. Uh, it's just that where it leads us to neglect the reasons on the other side, and and in this instance, they are also also relevant. So this as a couple of uh, implications. One is that, as as with any emotional appearance of of reasons, we should we shouldn't jump to conclusions. We should, if we feel strongly that this is the right way to go, whether it comes to empathic or other emotional reactions, uh, the responsible thing to do is is to to consider whether we've got the facts straight, whether whether there's uh, something to be said for the other side as, as well. Also, I think this this highlights that uh, even in these cases where empathy leads us astray, it's not like uh, not racist bias, unlike Bloom suggested, because that's not sensitive to any real reasons. If we do have a reason, it's just we're giving too much weight to it as, as a result of, of empathy. Okay. Um, so... Um, It, it it still remains a a problem that that empathy is, is biased. I mean, if even if uh, empathy leads us to stop hurting people when it's wrong to hurt people, even if it's to help many others, if it doesn't do this when when the person being hurt is is black, for example, then it's not doing its its job. So, uh, so we do need to somehow still deal with its bias, even if we. Uh, agree that its its limitations aren't aren't as as bad as as some people have suggested. It seems to me that th this gives us two options for making good moral judgments in in cases where empathy is likely to be biased. Either we have to override or or completely avoid somehow empathic responses, or somehow debias them. And I think that uh, Hume and Smith, who were the first to highlight both the importance of empathy and, and the biases that uh, it naturally has, they make, make a good case that there's that there's a case for both of these, these lines. So, so Hume thought that overriding or uh, even better avoiding empathy was essential when, when it comes to justice in particular. Uh, and, and that's because at least some rules of justice have little use for us if we make exceptions to them whenever uh, you know, we empathize with those who, who suffer from them on, on occasion. And that's why we need some sort of impartial 
institutional arrangements to, to prevent that. But I think even, even so, even in these cases, empathy can serve as a kind of check for dogmatism. So for example, if, if there's a seemingly justified regime of, of property ownership that constantly yields outcomes that appear unjustified in light of empathizing with those who are hurt by this system. I think of a hypothetical country in which rich people have more resources than they can ever use, while poor people are suffering without health insurance and health care and, and so on. Uh, then we should perhaps double check or triple check our reasoning our, our, that convinces us that this is what justice requires in this case. Now, one reason why Hume himself uh, so readily granted that, that justice need to be uh, non-empathic in its application was that he believed that uh, its justification nevertheless comes from empathy, that we approve of the, of the rules of justice only because for the most part, uh, consistent adherence to them yields, yields benefits to, to, to people, which then please us via empathy. But whether or not this is true, it seems to me that empathy is often necessary for us to grasp the point of our moral norms. While I think this is true of, of more familiar ones, I think it's easiest to see in case of, of more no, novel moral norms, such as the prohibition of dead naming, that is of calling trans people with the pre-transition names. For those of us like myself, who are not personally affected by dead naming, uh, the only way to really appreciate why it's wrong, it seems to me, and how badly wrong it is, it seems to be empathizing with the experience of, of those people who are affected by it. Um, so the, uh, the other way to deal with, with bias is, is instead of in, in cases where, where we don't have rules that we could apply is, is to try some, somehow deep bias empathy, if that's, that's possible. Now we know in principle what it would amount to given what we, what we uh, have learned about the biases for empathy. Very roughly, we need to upregulate empathy for outgroup members and most probably downregulate empathy for in-group members. Huma Smith both uh, make some interesting suggestions about the motivation and potential strategies for, for doing so. That's, that's the last thing I want to talk about. Uh, so that's the motivation. Uh, I, I think this is something I haven't come across, maybe it is there in the psychological literature, but, but Hume's idea is that we're motivated to regulate our empathic responses uh, because otherwise we end up in this sort of perpetual inter and interpersonal conflict. That, that's basic, basically the, the idea. Uh, so he says that it's the avoidance of, uh, quote, continual contradictions that motivates us to seek some steady and general points of view from which to, to empathize. Now his own suggestion for how to find this sort of shareable perspective are, are a bit opaque. But given that he talks about how we readily extend the kind of concern that we have regarding advantage and harm to those that, of harm to those near us or to other cases uh, which are resembling it but more, more distant, one natural interpretation is that we kind of imaginatively include the, the victim in our in-group uh, when we're engaging in reflective moral judgment. And only, only after this, we, we kind of empathize with them. And this meshes, I think, with some interesting recent work in the minimal group paradigm that, that seems to offer some support for this way of reducing em empathy bias. So what this research suggests very, very briefly is that that if people are quite arbitrarily led to perceive themselves as members of the same group, uh, as somebody who is otherwise an outgroup member, say someone of a different race, they empathize more with them. Now, Adam Smith, on, on my interpretation, uh, makes a somewhat different proposal, kind of urging us to empathize with both the agent and the victim of an action from a disinterested and informed uh, perspective like from a perspective of an impartial spectator, as it's sometimes put. So this is somewhat akin to kind of uh, downregulation strategies or experimental, uh, experimental manipulations uh, that tell subjects to approach an uh, emotional scenario like a scientist would. 
but here the goal isn't so much to minimize empathic response, but, but rather regularize it, as we might say, so that everyone can share the same response. Uh, now, it's not uh, within my competence to assess how successful these strategies uh, and, and motivations for deep bias in uh, regulation are, but I'd be very curious to hear what psychologists think and what kind of insights uh, you, you, you might have. Uh, I, I, when I was listening to Anat's talk, I thought that, you know, maybe like Smith would would prefer us not to view uh, people, but just to hear their their voices. Like that, that might be that one of the sort of things that that gives us a bit of that that distance, but but still keeps us engaged with their their uh, emotions and maybe regulates them just just suitably. Okay, so to conclude, I've tried to very briefly sketch how. Empathy, in spite of its biases and limitations, can be a positive force in human morality. It, it seems like it is an essential ingredient of morally significant personal relationships. It is, it is a seemingly indispensable tool for appreciating the reasons that we have for objecting to impersonal cost-benefit analysis and judgments based on that. And also uh, seemingly indispensable for appreciating the reasons there are for us to adopt general moral principles, even if we can apply them uh, without empathy itself. Uh, now, nevertheless, because empathy is responsive to some but not all moral reasons, I, I think uh, maybe we should maybe the best way for us to think of it is it's it's a tool that helps us reason better when it's used correctly. So I want to kind of flip Desert's line that reasoning is therefore essential to filter and evaluate emotional responses that guide moral decisions to. Empathy is therefore essential to filter and evaluate reasoning that guides moral decisions. Thanks. Thank you. This was great, really interesting. Uh, so just a reminder, if you have questions for our speaker, you can just write them in the Q&A, we'll read them. Um, but Anat, if you have questions for, for Auntie, Feel free to jump in while we wait for others to write down their questions. I'm happy to start then. I, I'll, I'll, I'll have to formalize it as we speak, but there are two things that came to my mind when you were um, talking. One is that I think, like you said, it was fascinating because for me as a psychologist, the first part was a part that I knew well, but then the second part were things that were new to me, but so relevant to my work. So thank you. And one of the things that were really interesting for me was the, the Scanlon's example um, with a um, football or soccer. And I do a different line of work that I didn't talk about here is exactly comparing these different group sizes. So not the one versus a million, which we know, you know, people are, can relate to the yeah. one and empathize with them more. But we've run a line of studies where we show that people are as empathic to you know, four people in, in pain versus eight or 20 or 10 versus 100, or we can play with the numbers. Um, they don't really care about the numbers of people in the group, but they're very sensitive to the amount of pain. So it's not even this insensitivity. Some of these explanations are that um, this emotional automatic reaction is not sensitive to numbers. So we can't compare 100,000 to 6 million, right? These are too big for our effective system. But we show it with examples from like um, people who um, lose money, right? Or your boss tells you you should eat 20 people will get their salary lowered by $100 or 100 people will get their salary um, lowered by $20. You can play with the numbers and yeah. show that people are actually very sensitive to numbers. So they understand that, you know, losing $100 is worse than losing $20. They're very sensitive to that, and very empathic to the people who lose a lot or are in more pain or get a more severe disease. We could play with, you know, what is the amount of pain, but they're not sensitive. If you look, use the exact same numbers and have them as the numbers of people in pain, yeah. they're not sensitive to that. And we've just, you know, we've just sent this um, paper to review with all these different examples and treated it as a bias. And like mm -hmm. you said, your example, you enlightened this other view of this as, you know, why this is actually 
also sometimes very advantageous, right? And the explanation that we gave, and it, it, you know, it's not, it doesn't go against all these other explanations, but I think it's part of it is something that I've talked about a bit, how empathy is something that goes through the self. So all we can do is simulate what this other person is going through. So in your example, I can either simulate what this person who is going to get all this huge electric shocks is going to go through, and that's terrible, or I can simulate what a person who is going to miss, to miss 15 minutes of this game is going to yeah. do. I can't simulate 15 billion people. I can't even simulate 20 people. It's not a question of big numbers. It's a question of I'm one person. I can imagine how it is to go through this or that. And that is what gives you know the, the more pain a much bigger mm. um, um, price or, or, yeah. or more. So yeah. thank that, you for that. Yeah, no, that 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 that's really uh, really fascinating to hear. It's, uh, I mean, uh, and so so Scanlon's uh, view, I guess, is 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 maybe the the best known or the most fully developed view in in this in in this vein, where the the idea the kind of whole idea of this sort of contractualist approach is that. That we we shouldn't be looking at the numbers when the stakes are different for different people. That we have to be able to justify the the principles on which, which we act to each individual one by one. So we look at who has the strongest objection, and it doesn't matter if there's a, you know, a billion people. If all of them have weak objection to to cutting off the broadcast, then we should cut off the broadcast. And there's there's many applications of this. Like obviously, if you think about say healthcare, for example. You know, do we do you know treat people who are in the biggest need, or or you know, a larger number of people with with a, just a headache, or or do we impose COVID restrictions, which will harm you know uh, slightly harm a lot of people, but bring bring a big benefit to uh, the at risk groups who are able to participate in society and and, and so on. So it's a lot of practical implications. Um, another thing I I, I want to say is, is a bit more theoretical is that. I'm myself sympathetic to this kind of approach. There's also uh, a bunch of alternative uh, views in ethics that 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 uh, give priority to the worst of in 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 different ways. So so you have this kind of prioritarian views that that are kind of aggregative. They say that we should you know add up all the benefits and and and, and harms, but we should give particular weight to those who are worst off in the distribution. And and uh, and that that will sometimes have the same results as this sort of uh, contractarian approach. And it's interesting to me that it, it does look like empathy kind of naturally seeks the you know the, the, the person who is worst hurt hurt by something and kind of sides with them. So so if we you know like like these these ethical views, then then we should also like empathy. That's that's part of my my point here. Thank you. And then I have one more point that I wanted to mention from a. Um, psychology point of view to, to your last point about how we can do it. And so you said, maybe if we just listen and then don't have the biases from, you know, seeing the person and how much they're similar to you or another view that's taken by psychologists in recent years is the opposite is using these, using these virtual reality techniques to try to put yourself in everyone's shoes, right? So yeah, yeah. You try to feel what it, you know, take the perspective of, um, both Palestinians and Israelis in conflict or of how it feels like to be an older person versus a younger person, or you can do this in different ways, but I wanted to, to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks. That's, that, that is, uh, that is interesting. And, and I guess, I guess that, that really kind of highlights the, um, diversity of, of strategies by which we, we might, uh, accomplish this sort of, uh, you know, simultaneous up and down regulation of of the the naturally biased responses and and regulation uh, strategies. Uh, so, so of course we could also imagine like uh, some sort of veil of ignorance type of uh, strategy where you you don't know which which group you you belong to. That would be more going in the kind of distance distance direction. Uh, I, I guess I'm. I would probably be more optimistic of of those kind of cooler strategies than the than the hot ones that uh, try to upregulate the 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 responses. Uh, may, maybe it's uh, 
Uh, and I guess the which which way you uh, prefer might might also depend on uh, how important you think that the reasons that empathy tracks are relative to other kinds of reasons that 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 also bear on on, on these situations. And for this sort of political situations, I, I was just so just this this morning I was I was reading about the fighting in Sudan, and uh, uh, and. It, you know, for an outsider, like reading a few articles, like the situation just so, so first, like I was reflecting on this, like you know, they were describing all these horrible things that one part, one side of the, the conflict does, then it really does kind of make you feel those are the bad guys. But then it turns out that the, the bad guys are now in the favor of the civilian government and you're, you're you know, you if you try to do it through empathy or through, you know, emotion, it, it, it just... For this type of political situation, I, I think uh, we can leave quite a lot of work to to just uh, cooler approaches. Uh, I'm going to turn on the light here because uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm it's it's evening here in in, in Finland. So, uh, but go ahead. Okay. In the meantime, um, there's two questions that we got from the audience. One is for Anna. The other one is for Anti. I'm going to start with a question for Anti which is about anti-empathy anti -empathy moral arguments and mentions the work of Prince. Prince in particular surprises me because the connection between reason and emotion is so well established. So the question is, how do the proponents of the bias argument deal with that research? Uh, well, so, so, so Prince is, uh, he, he is a, he is a big fan of, of emotions, but uh, not of empathy in in particular. So, because uh, for for many of the same reasons as as Bloom is critical of 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 empathy. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure how much more I can I can say about his his works. I it except that he so he. He certainly appreciates a connection between emotions and reasons, but he thinks that other emotions are not subject to the same sort of biases as as empathy is. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I myself am skeptical of of that particular claim. It, it does seem to me that 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 it, it won't be the same biases. That that that's that's true. Uh, but but uh, if if we you know went through each particular emotion. Yeah, uh, we we could find find some some sort of problems with it. Uh, also, of course, we can empathize with a, a host of different emotions. Uh, that that's that's one thing that when I've been reading this psychological research uh, in preparation for this, uh, there is uh, even though it's recognized by by many people that we can empathize with a lot of different emotions. There there tends to be this sort of. Uh, emphasis on emphasizing with pain and and empathizing with pain and suffering above all, all other ones okay well hopefully that answers the question if not feel free to write a follow-up um Anat, there's a question for you so the question is about self-report of emotion so this, this question is wondering if you've thought about how accurate self-report of emotion is or whether you're just measuring synchrony that's a really important question. Thank you for this question. We're thinking about it all the time. We started with this measure that we were so proud of because we said, now we really know how accurate people are because we have the ground truth, what the person actually said that they felt. And the more we got into that, and these are lay people, they're not experts at expressing their emotions or at looking into their emotions. Or, you know, some people said, I felt, if you think about this continuous measure, they rated it as like, I didn't feel, I felt positive, positive, positive. It went down to negative like this. And then raters sometimes rate a much more complex story. Which one is correct, right? Um, and I don't have a clear answer about that. I think it's in some ways the philosophical question. Is the answer of what you felt what you said that you felt? If we had the most amazing computer that could read your brains and body and whatever and said, no, Anat says that she was just a little bit sad but actually she was you know, furious. Which one is correct? I think there's really no 
good, clear answer for that. What we started doing in some of our cases is comparing the perceiver's notion of what the target felt to both the target, which is what I told you about. This is an empathic accuracy score. But once we're collecting more and more data now, we can also compare it to some kind of wisdom of crowds, right? What, more pe what most people say that this person was feeling. And then it's not empathic accuracy as, as it is. It doesn't say how accurate the perceiver is compared to what the person said they felt, but it would how accurate they are compared to most people in society or compared to others or something like that. Um, that's even a harder question when you think about people with different um, clinical conditions, right? We're now filming people who are autistic, tell their emotional stories and describe what they felt while they were telling the stories. Do they know what they felt? If someone else says, you know, they're saying that they're tired, it's clear that they're angry, who's correct? What if it's their psychologists who say, you know, I know this person really well and I'm an expert in understanding other people's emotions and I tell you, they are actually in grief. Who has the right answer? So we're using this these self-report measures as a measure of something that the person says about what their own experience was, but how close is it, it is to what they actually felt is probably, you know, has, has a lot of different answers and a lot of variants in that. But it is indicative at least. Yes. We can say that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, those are the questions. Daryl, if you have a question, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I love both talks and I, I had onto your talk raised several interesting questions. I, I, I love the idea of focusing on how people regulate empathy because for whatever reason that is sort of neglected in some of the arguments against empathy by Bloom and Prinz, it's always the assumption of this ballistic process that just is biased in this way. But the idea of the second order regulation of empathy, thinking about how people can try to, I, I liked the, how you put it, um, the regularization of empathy across different contexts. Um, it is really fascinating. And I guess, you know, one question would be, well, one comment, one question, I guess. Um, I mean, the idea of justified partiality was fascinating. So some of my own, some of my colleagues and I have wondered about the ethical standard being used. Like if you if you evaluate the, the empathy arguments, the anti-empathy arguments, either on a kind of scientific basis about whether they get the science right or the more of a normative basis, thinking about you know, is it such that we all do aspire to this strong utilitarian standard? And so I, I really appreciated the the idea of, of the justified partiality piece. And there is some interesting empirical work um, looking at third party judgments about empathy that's distributed either towards partial relationships. This is a Ryan McManus Lee and Young's work, or in a in more of an equitable or how 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 your distributions of empathy and prosocial outcomes two different targets that you have closer or distant relationships with, how those are perceived by third-party raters. Um, but I guess the other, like the question, the main question I had, I was really struck by this point you made about the differences between limitations and bias. because so I think those are often conflated a lot in discussions of empathy deficits. Their terms are not always defined super clearly. And I think that sometimes like researchers on this identifiable victim effect, compassion collapse, kind of the, the numeracy piece, they do try to suggest that we have this norm that we should empathize more with more people. Um, and they, there are some studies looking at like, like people's normative predictions about how they would like to respond that sometimes track with that. But it seems like it raises this interesting question you mentioned the second order bias issue and like if it's extra hard to empathize in some cases, if you think of it from a normative perspective, like what what ought we recommend to people in terms of their physical health, their emotional well-being, their exhaustion? Um, how do we approach the task of asking people to empathize or not as like an ethical recommendation if we're mindful of possible drawbacks, possible limitations? Um, because it seems like part of this implies this norm for like what a correct response or like what we should aspire to. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of like some of the 
and I'll finish my question. I'm just rambling. But uh, one of the one of my entry points into moral psychology was this idea of the ought can th distinction. Like, should we recommend something to people they can't achieve as an ethical recommendation? And so I'm just curious in that space of ideas, like, how do you approach, like, what a what a normative benchmark would look like for empathy in these challenging contexts? And like how you would use this information to like provide a practical ethical kind of recommendation moving forward. Hmm. Yeah. So, so I think that uh, one one thing that I've, I've been thinking about these these cases that involve a, a lot of people. Uh, I think in in order to Kind of think about them in in some sort of uh, you know, rational analytic fashion. We we kind of have to simplify our options. We're just not not capable of uh, responding to to every relevant consideration. Uh, so so we can so 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 take for example the um, the Batson study, the the Q jumping study, where people. Are led to empathize with uh, a particular sick child, and even though they're told that, you know, if you move them up the queue, then other children who have been waiting longer or or even even sicker, they they will have to, they they'll end up waiting, and people are li likely to 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 move them up. So today you could you could think you have these two basic options, you know, whether you uh, move them up the queue or or not, uh, and each of those options has consequences both for that one child and and all the all the other ones we we can't think of all those other ones one by one so so i think I, probably often in those situations we can kind of think of a representative individual uh, in 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 that group if they're similar enough at least and and we can kind of so so, so what what seems to happen in in that kind of study is basically that you you just neglect that information even though it's given to people in the in the uh paradigm they, they they're just not uh led to treat them as individuals so so i, I think that uh th this is kind of ties in what i was saying saying during my talk about how how we when we have a, a strong emotional reaction of any sort to something that that kind of guides our moral thinking in one direction or another uh, it, it tends to be a, a good idea to kind of pause for a, for a minute, count to ten or something like that, <laughs> and think about well, what's on the other side. Uh, so, so if if you did, uh, so so I don't think it's unrealistic to ask of people to to you know think of a representative individual on the who would end up being a loser of this moving this person up up the queue, and empathize with that person. And if you did that, then then you then you would reluctantly perhaps you know most most likely conclude that this this is the wrong thing to do like that that would uh support the sort of principles that 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 you probably deep down have that the, that that would be the same sort of judgment that that you would make if you were genuinely impartial between all, all of these these individuals so so i think that that's sort of one sort of feasible strategy in at least some some of this sort of conflict situations um Oh, and but then when it gets gets too complex uh, for for us to kind of emotionally appreciate the different dimensions, then 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 I think that we we just have to have to rely on on rules of uh, thumb or or rules in in any case uh, that that might ultimately be based on on emotional responses as sentimentalists like Hume and Smith argued. Uh, I mean the. <sighs> We, the, the like you, you could imagine like the the kind of argument that they 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 might make that we, you know, we do feel, we, um, you know, do think that it's better that that more people have, have pleasure than fewer people have pleasure, uh, and and we we think that pleasure is better than pain maybe through empathy through our own own experience, so we can kind of put those together. In our, our reasoning, even if both of these ultimately derive from emotional responses, uh, in contexts where we can't rely on them, we we can we can then uh, make use of these 
generalizations, kind of inductive generalizations, as, as Smith would, would have it. Uh, again, I think we can be kind of neutral on whether they're ultimately ultimately based on sentiment or or not. We can we can think that alternatively, you can think that there's a kind of complementarity between uh, kind of more more rational based principles and then these uh, empathic and other emotional responses. I don't know. I hope this answers to some extent your your question. Yeah, no, no it does, and I think there's a plenty of interesting developmental work on how if you trace back the learning of particular moral rules that even if in the moment when you use them, they, they don't have emotion or empathetic res resonance attached to them, the, the developmental history of the rules may have involved, you know, empathetic uh, identification of, you know, if I'm, if I'm telling my son, you know, well, if you, if this person's crying, you know, think about how you would feel like developmentally, that could be the basis of long-term moral rules that are then utilized to navigate these different contexts. Hmm. But one thing that interests me, if I may, may just say say quickly in in this context, is uh, whether whether this uh, in in this ballpark there's 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 something uh, that turns out to be a deep difference between the way between machine learning and and human learning, because uh, uh, obviously we've seen great advances in machine learning and AI I recently. Uh, but, but at least as as far as we know so far, these these machines, they lack this one kind of feedback, or you know they 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 capable of generalizing from from uh, kind of in inputs that they get. Uh, but but one advantage that that children seem to have when it comes to morality in particular is that that they have the feelings that that you know what what you know. It, if they see that someone else is hurt by what they did, they even you don't have to instruct the children to you know that it's it's a bad thing to to hurt other people. It may suffice that they they empathically take on the the pain of the other person. They say, oh, this wasn't this wasn't a good thing to do after after all. Even though maybe it felt good to throw the thing at you know in the first place, but but when you see the other person, other kid being hit and and crying, then then that that you know that you know do that a few times, and you kind of pick up on this rule that. You no, know, you should be careful around other people when you're you're throwing stuff. Now, now it seems that th this isn't available in the case of of AI, and uh, you know that that that's something I, I'm interested in in looking into the the kind of differences between artificial and 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 human moral understanding. There is a question that I think it's for both of our speakers: Is empathy different from compassion? If so, how? Who wants to answer? <laughs> Anat, you probably know the official psychological definition better than- I was gonna mention that too, yeah, probably. <laughs> but I wanted to say, I can give the, the psychological take on it at least from the, from the last few years. So there's trying to be like, just as psychologists have been trying to dissect the term empathy into these different components that we all call empathy, but actually they might be very different things, right? Understanding the other person, feeling with the other person, motivated to help the other person. We call this all empathy. So similarly, psychologists have been trying to differentiate empathy from compassion. And the definitions are basically that if effective empathy is feeling with the, the other person, um, compassion is more feeling for the other person. It's usually, it doesn't have to be the same emotion. It's usually a different emotion. You feel bad or sad, or um, you, you feel some empathic react, some, I'm trying not to use these words, some effective reaction towards that person, but it doesn't have to be the same emotion as that person. And it's more related to this feeling of care and wanting to help them. So some of these definitions differ this way. I still, you see that I'm hesitant because I think that in our language, most people use them very similarly. And, and I like in this aspect, you know, Daryl's work and others that show that um, there are many people who think that maybe compassion would be better off than we, we would be better off if we felt compassion rather than empathy. So we won't be so distressed when we feel with our patients or our friends, we feel for them. And that gives some kind of distance but actually, I think Daryl and others show that sometimes people are just as reluctant to feel compassion as they are to feel empathy. It comes with a price 
either way. Um, but, but these are important differentiations nonetheless. So, so for example, I'm, in, I'm a bit involved in um, studies on physicians and there is a long, you know, there's a big debate on whether physicians should be empathic or not and what are the advantages. There are definitely lots of advantages for the patients of having an empathic physician, but lots of very um, severe prices for the physicians and lots of burnout is, is related to empathy. And so some think that maybe if we teach doctors to be compassionate and not empathic, then they would have this distance that would you know, leave the advantages for the patients, but also without the burnout for the physicians. I think it's an open question. I don't think psychologists have, have really um, strong data to show that, but some of the ideas is that maybe this feeling for rather than feeling with has advantages that, that empathy doesn't have. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just very quick addition to that uh, is that uh, we we can certainly em empathize with uh, positive emotions of other people. We can feel empathic joy, and and that's a context in which we rarely talk about compassion. So so that's that's another. Uh, yeah. Kind of yeah. It it does make for an interesting entry point into some of the normative debates that you were talking about, Auntie. Like if 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 folks like especially Bloom is often contrasted compassion with empathy, um, but is even some of his more recent writing has tried to acknowledge that, you know, compassion may have its biases too, but there's still this positioning that compassion's biases are not as bad. Um, and so it's, I think it's in it for, for my own personal uh, biased uh, empathic perspective. Um, it is interesting to think about the ways in which the different emotions can have their own limitations and biases and um, what the both the the scientific take on like what exactly are the boundary conditions on like enumeracy, for example, or intergroup empathy gaps, if we can move those around with interventions, you know, does that mean they're always fixed? But then the normative piece too, like even if you just even if you grant that empathy is enumerate in the ways you were describing, like what are the standards of what are the normative standards for using to, to evaluate those? And I think the, the partiality piece is, is quite fascinating in that respect. Yeah, okay. So we still have a few minutes left. So if anybody else wants to ask a question, I'm sure that our speakers will be very happy to answer them. Um, if not, if I can't, I just wanted to quickly go back to the example that Auntie mentioned about the example from Scanlon. Um, it's a very quick question. Um, it made me think about Benatar's asymmetry between pain and pleasure, that absence of pain is good, but absence of pleasure is not bad. And I was wondering, well, I was trying to follow your argument about whether that intuition plays more of a role in our, the background of our mind than, than we would think if making a decision that it's non-utilitarian. What do you think? Mm. I, I'm myself, a, I confess I'm skeptical of that asymmetry in, in general. Like I think not having pleasure would be terrible, like or positive experience more more general, like just having some sort of neutral experience. So, so I'm not sure if, if that's that's the case, uh, but, uh, but maybe, Maybe another way, but but I mean you're right that that this particular example has that that asymmetry built into it. Yeah, as yeah well. it was so, very like very yeah. much like about that because if I think about like you know those those billions of people not watching something that is pleasurable, I'm like okay, mm. but like that, that guy agonizing, like we all yeah. agree that like, absence yeah. of pain is definitely good. So 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 the other other sort of uh, case that people talk about in, in 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 this sort of context is this sort of headaches versus lives type of situation. That that you know you can you have certain limited healthcare funds and you can use them to you know to save ten people's lives or a million people's headaches. Uh, what you know what should you do? Again, you know depending on you give certain values to these uh, to to the headaches. It's you know it's a, it's a negative one uh, that the death uh, you know has has a much bigger negative value. But nevertheless, if there's enough of people who have the headache, then then you let those ten people die, and that's that's a sort of. Many people have the same intuition about that case that 
that we you know it's the worst off in, who 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 count in in this comparison we the the headaches are are irrelevant whereas you know if it comes to a different sort of trade off like headaches versus you know some some slightly more serious illness then then the then the numbers do turn out to to matter it's a, it's a big debate within ethics at the moment uh, how how we should should understand that this this kind of uh, like well, moral aggregation in in general, but uh, yeah. uh, but anyway, it it does seem that for for many people, that particular feature of the Scanlon case that you are kind of putting pain and pleasure against each other is not decisive. In, it, it's just the kind of the size of the the burden that you have to bear, and because after, it's also you can think of it as a burden of losing the fifteen minutes of the World Cup final, like. The last one, it was super exciting. It would have been awful if I couldn't have watched the last 15 minutes of it. Like so much happened in that time. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, after that, I wasn't so sure if I agree with Scanlon about that. <laughs> I also used to be skeptical about that asymmetry. And then I spent a whole weekend with incredible back pain. And when it went away, I thought, no, absence of pain is definitely good. I, I Now I buy it. This is what it <laughs> live your philosophy yes right well uh we still have 10 minutes we'll what daryl what how do you want to proceed we should just wait if more people have questions if there's any other question that you folks have for each other i mean uh, I, yeah i think if spend the past like eight or nine minutes like if there's anyone else has any questions please yep. feel free to drop them into the chat um but, you know, I'm also, I think what I did have one other question, but I'm also just trying, I'm also, as I've heard both talks, trying to think about, I appreciated how there already was this integration of your talks and thinking about how to consider, you know, using virtual mediated technologies to maybe do this regularizing of empathy or, or at the very least, how to like take a step back and consider some of the normative questions through the lens of novel ways in which these different channels have emerged. Um, and if anything, it seems like maybe one thing I'm hearing is that Zoom has, for example, added these complexities with what our moral expectations are in some of these spaces, like to, to further complicate, like how the task of regularizing empathy, I mean, it seems like that's complicated enough just within you know, typical physical dyadic human to human interactions, much less the more com complicated versions that we have here. Um, so I don't know, I'd just be curious to think more about those connections. I mean, the, the, que the question that I had was just, um, it reminds me a little bit of, there was some older work in developmental psychology by Martin Hoffman on essentially using moral principles to regulate one's empathy biases. So it's kind of, it's getting at the same sort of idea of regular regularization to some extent, like concerns about empathic over arousal, be it in physician context or otherwise. Um, and, and the broader awareness that there are these limitations on empathy that may exist. But as if I'm recalling the argument correctly, part of the idea was if you have moral principles in place, that are perhaps derived from this empathetic induction over time through through learning, they kind of can help you to regulate empathy and keep it from getting too out of control in particular contexts. Um, and so I'm, I'm just, one of the things I've, I've been familiar with some of your work is just interesting is the idea that to not conflate empathy in its worst versions, like empathy as it's in a dysregulated kind of un, uninhibited version of it versus a more well-regulated version of empathy. And I, I think if you do that, it opens up this space between like empathy as a target of critique and then our own like decisions on how to manage our own emotions and our own regulation. And so I realized that was like a comment and a question and some other form of hmm. elocution there, but I'm just, I don't know, I'm just curious how, how you can use principles to regulate in this way. Hmm. Uh, can, I, can I say something uh, uh, quickly in, in response to that? Uh, so, um, so I'm actually, 
So one one thing that this this makes me think about is is actually related to your work on on the motivations for for empathizing. Uh, so so I'm so 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 one thing I find really interesting in this in this field is like how how the how the different motives for reg regulating empathy uh, interact with the strategies that we use to to do the regulation like like those cases where you know you're you're motivated to avoid empathizing with out groups and then as a result of that you have this sort of dehumanizing strategy for for example like there, there seems to be there's kind of a mesh between uh, the the two things so so it looks like seems to me like moral principles could could kind of play different roles here so one could be they could be it could motivate us to regulate empathy in in a in a certain way. So, so so one thing that I I I was just just reading yesterday this this um, paper that just came out this year uh, by the South uh, African researchers. Um, uh, I ha had their names on one of the the slide there. Uh, I, I should I should mention it out out of fairness to them. So this was. Uh, Dazed and Fury, uh, perhaps you, you you know of their work. Uh, so, so they were trying to uh, uh, apply this minimal group paradigm experiments uh, in South African context, and and they discovered that uh, it did reduce some empathy biases, but not racial bias. That 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 remained even you know once. He, you were assigned to the same team, but you still empathize less with the black members of the team. And uh, but what, one thing that I mentioned kind of in, in passing in that, that, that I, I found intriguing was that the people who kind of managed best to, uh, to kind of upregulate their response to outgroup members in, in, in those, those studies uh, were people whose, whose motivation uh, was uh, Let's see what what was the phrase I had it there. Yeah, so they had internal motivation to respond without prejudice. So so you could think, well, that that might that motivation might come from from a moral principle that that you accept, and that might make a difference to the the stra strategies that you use, or or, or just the the outcomes of uh, of uh, you know regulating your empathic response. So. So I, th I thought that was really intriguing, and, but I didn't have time to to read whether there's more research on this. Uh, maybe maybe you people can 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 inform me. Yeah, no, that's definitely. Uh, I'll, I have not read that paper yet, but I'll have to take a look at it. it sounds really interesting. Well, Anat and Auntie, do you have any sort of questions for each other that? You haven't had the haven't had the chance to ask, or we could we could talk about other in, in the last few minutes. You know, ways to see the interface between your work as well. So what I was thinking about when I think about this interface, and and Auntie mentioned it as well, is that it seems as the more senses we have involved, or at least if we think about these Zoom interactions, having the camera on versus off, and probably even more when you meet people in person and so forth, the more we have these effective components of the interaction. And if you think about them in, in a moral stance, they have advantages and disadvantages, right? You can see the whole realm. So if you are in a context of the classroom, you really want these effective components. You want people to be more engaged. You want the person talking to know that they're being you know, listened to. Um, you want people to be more involved with one another. And so we see all these advantages of having this strong, effective experience. And also when, when we talk to a friend in pain or when we hear different stories, if, if you want empathy to be involved, if you think it has advantages, you want all these senses to be present. Um, when you want to be more neutral, when you think empathy would bias your decisions in ways that you don't want to be biased in, you probably want less of this information. And I know, for example, in Israel, some governmental decisions for example, how to divide, you know, a, a specific amount of money, two different medications each year, governments have to decide what they're going to give medications to. 
And at least in terms of best practices, who knows what's really done in the government, but in terms of best practices, they're told not to read about specific examples of people who are going through these diseases and not to involve the you know, friend or neighbor that they know who has this or that disease, but to try to look at you know, the numbers, the effects it has, and, and trying to really um, you know, take everything into account ignoring the biases and stories and videos and friends and close relations that that may affect us so so i think really thinking about these how these senses affect our our effective responses and when we want them more and should get more of them and when we might need them less is is interesting to think about yeah i, I certainly agree with that now, one thing i was i was thinking about when you were talking was uh whether um uh, uh, whether you've already done studies I, I know that there's uh there's a lot of psychologists in Israel who are understandably interested in the psychology of conflict and I've drawn on work of Aaron Halper in, in the in the past myself and uh so uh so maybe Maybe soon you'll you'll do a study in which Palestinians and is Israelis are telling stories to each other on Zoom rather than than some other way, and and you know may, maybe it's uh, you might think that it's it's easier to find a, an emotional middle ground if if you're if you have that you know somewhat distancing effect in in place where it. it where it, it really I mean I I know that those those stories can be like very bad very very horrible and 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 that and obviously lead to just shutting out and, and not wanting to hear about that that those horrible things but but maybe it, it would be easier to take if it was moderated by by this sort of virtual presence rather than 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 physical presence so, so yeah I, I agree that that's that's a that's a really interesting topic to work on thank you so we're not doing exactly that right now, but it's definitely something to think about. And I am collaborating also with Iran Halperin on these different questions of intergroup empathy. And I think that really one thing we can think about is how these different senses and how close you are to the other person in terms of presence and different information channels helps or hinders our empathy. And the second thing that psychologists have known for a while and philosophers is finding this common ground, right? If you think about, so Palestinians living in Israel are also, you know, citizens and, and study in the university together. So hearing these different stories, for example, that we record in our lab, some of them are, are along these different lines of everyday activities. And suddenly you realize that this Palestinian person is actually a student who has, you know, um, fear from the coming exams or broke up with her boyfriend or, or that actually we have a lot in common that that the media or our in-groups don't want us to, to really realize. So also finding these common ground is really something. And you see the same with physicians, right? Once you come to a physician and you know you you find something that's in common, you know that you you got you maybe got their empathy or it's true with all of us. But if we can think of our, of our daily lives and how if we want to make someone if you want to reach out or the other way around, if we want to empathize more with someone else, maybe that's a way to look at it. We can find that common ground, right? Actually, it reminds me of my my father or my child or my friend, or we have some, you know, similar hobbies or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that kind of interestingly kind of links with this sort of minimal group kind of thinking like it's no more no no longer quite so minimal if, if there is you know your your elton john fans you know they're part of the same group that maybe maybe that suffices to to upregulate your 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 empathic responses in spite of some fundamental differences It'd be interesting too to just combining both of those, like thinking about again, like the perceived benefits of these different modalities in those polarized contexts. You know, like both. I mean, it'd be interesting if you saw the same the same results, but also if you look at you know within group, but also cross group interactions. Like, are the benefits of being seen felt in the same way by someone who's being listened to by someone from an opposing? Uh, group, whatever that is comprised. 
I can say in a sentence, I know we need to end, that one of the things we are running right now is something similar with autistic individuals, right? There's also a question that autistic individuals have many times um, either hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity into different senses. And it may be that just having all this information together is what hinders their empathy. And maybe if they could just hear the other person or just have what they want to say in writing, maybe that could actually enhance their empathic responses. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm sure we could, we could talk all afternoon. This has been a really fascinating session. Um, being mindful of the time, we probably should uh, call it a day for today. I want to thank both of you, Dr. Anat Perry, Dr. Antti Kapanen, for, for joining us. This has been a really, I think, personally, uh, for my own empathetic bias, a, a great like closing session because it's both highlighted some really interesting fundamental questions about the nature of empathy and communication, but also nesting those within very specific contexts and then thinking about the broader philosophical normative implications. Um, one of our guests, Kathy Warner, uh, one of the professors here says thank you for the both talks. Um, and yeah, I just wanna thank you all for attending. If you have any follow-up questions or thoughts, please feel free to reach out. Um, this is gonna be the end of the fifth year of the Expanding Empathy series. We'll hopefully be back again next year I want to thank the Department of Psychology and the Department of Philosophy at Penn State for helping to fund this and helping to show the value of getting these two disciplines together in the same space and seeing what happens. Uh, the Brock Ethics Institute for funding this, uh, Martina for joining me as a co-host um, for, for these panels, um, David Price and Ken Grau for uh, making the tech work so smoothly and Betsy Van Noy for helping coordinate everything else. So thanks everyone. Hope you had a good, hope you enjoyed these. We'll have the recordings up before too long. Have a good rest of your day.